So what can archaeologists do when they're dealing with materials that are clearly older than 50,000 years old when radiocarbon dating is useless? Well, the things you can do is use a different dating technique. Um, and potassium argon dating, for example, uh, is based really on the same kind of principle as radiocarbon dating. It deals with isotopes that decay over time, but it's using isotopes that have a much longer half-life, that take much, much longer uh, to decay. Uh, these kinds of uh, particles, potassium, radioactive potassium, are found in volcanic materials. So typically this dating technique is used um, in areas that had volcanic activity where there's volcanic ash either below or above or sometimes even uh, on top of the archaeological layers that you're interested in by dating the particles uh, in the volcanic ash you can then get a date um, for that archaeological layer right? so essentially when the magma is formed and the volcanic ash uh, is spewed out um, there is radioactive potassium in there and over time, just like radiocarbon, it will break down into, over time, it will break down into argon gas, actually. Uh, so you can date things from 100,000 years ago to about uh, several million years ago. Uh, one of the most well-known examples of this technique being used are the famous Leitoli uh, footprints in East Africa. Right, This was, uh, they could tell, bipedal hominids. And when they dated the ash, it dated to about three and a half million years ago. Uh, so it looks like in this part of East Africa, there was probably a volcanic eruption. And then uh, several uh, Australopithecines walked in the volcanic ash, left their footprints. Um, and by dating the ash, you are essentially dating the footprints. Um, so that's another technique. And there are other isotopes that are used uh, for s such as uranium fission dating um, that can kind of fill in the gaps uh, by ra of radiocarbon dating. Right. Okay, let's, we're going to look at a couple of other techniques um, and see how they work just so you get an idea. And then we'll talk about a, another form of relative dating. Everything we've looked at so far, though, is absolute dating. Okay, obsidian hydration. Obsidian is a black volcanic glass. Um, it's very, very sharp. We'll get to see some obsidian uh, this semester, I believe. Um, it was used as tools, for tools by ancient people, very highly prized, uh, great commodity in the ancient world. Um, can you actually date an obsidian tool? Well, there's a system called obsidian hydration, right? That is when the edge of that tool is made, and then after it is left in the ground, slowly obsidian will absorb water molecules. Right? And they will sort of penetrate slowly inwards. Now, if you cut a small sample of the obsidian and you look at it under a special microscope, uh, that layer, that water layer, will actually show up. Now, if you measure the water layer, you can then sort of assume the thicker the layer, the older it is. It's been in the ground longer, and it has more had more time to absorb water. You have to figure out what the rates of hydration in the area would be, and then you could use that to estimate when that tool was made. Now, why couldn't you use potassium argon dating to date an obsidian tool? Right? After all, obsidian is a volcanic material. Right? But if you use obsidian uh, potassium argon dating to date an obsidian tool, what you're actually dating is not when the tool is made. You're dating how old the rock is, right? how long ago since that magma formed. Right? So you're not getting the date of the tool. You're getting the date of the rock. That's why you have to use obsidian hydration. Obsidian hydration might give you uh, a, a, a date like 6,000 years ago, 
And potassium argon dating will give you, will tell you, oh, this rock dates from 5 million years ago. That doesn't tell you how old the tool is, right? So you can't use potassium argon dating on the obsidian tool. Okay, another technique is known as thermoluminescence, right? Thermoluminescence, as you can guess, deals with heat and light. Uh, in thermoluminescence, you are working with any fired clay that has been fired over, I believe it's 700 degrees centigrade. That um, piece of clay, it could be pottery, it could be something else, is reheated under laboratory conditions. And once it's reheated, it actually gives off different wavelengths of light. The intensity and the different wavelengths can be measured and that will give you an approximation of when that clay was last fired. All right, so that's thermoluminescence. A similar technique, or one that could be used on similar uh, materials, is archaeomagnetic dating. Now, the way archaeomagnetic dating works, it has to be used on something fixed in the ground that's also made of clay. You'll see why in just a minute. But the way it works is that when you have a hearth uh, and you have, let's say, a hearth made of clay, there are going to be iron par particles in the clay. When you apply heat, those, there's going to be enough sort of flux that those iron particles can realign towards magnetic north. Right? Now, how does this actually help you date something? When the heart, you'll see in just a minute, when the hearth cools, the magnetic particles, the iron, is, are fixed in that position. All right, well, how does it help you date something? Well, magnetic north has actually shifted over time. And by getting a database of these shifts and then comparing it to the uh, north in your sample, you could then figure out how old that hearth was. Now, obviously, this can't be used on something like a pot because a pot is not stationary. It can be moved. So maybe when it was fired, those iron particles um, measured towards north. But once the pot was taken away and moved and spun around, now the orientation is all off. So it's only something like a hearth, which where its position doesn't change, right? It's fixed and tied to the floor. Um, but again, you can see is what you would do in the hearth. You would take a, a square like that. You would cut it into the hearth material. You take a compass and you would measure uh, north today uh, on that sample. Take it back to the lab. You measure the north orientation of the material itself and then see how it varies from magnetic north today, and then you're able to figure out the date. Right. Okay, so those are some of the absolute dating techniques archaeologists use. Let's look at one more uh, relative dating technique. We looked at frequency seriation so far. Right? Frequency seriation is based on these battleship curves where new styles transition slowly over time there is related to this is another kind of seriation called stylistic seriation with stylistic seriation you're trying to look at the materials the styles themselves and see how they change over time now in the marblehead cemetery you might have noticed that it looked like with some of the gravestones, it looked like some of them were sort of transitional between the death's head and the cherub, right? That is, there seemed to be kind of a slow, almost metamorphosis over time. The archaeologist who pioneered this technique was a guy by the name of Flinders Petrie, right? And he uh, worked in Egypt, and he was working on some early... Uh, dynastic Egyptian tombs and also some pre-dynastic Egyptian tombs so from the time period before the pyramids um, and he had a number of graves where he collected the pottery 
But he didn't actually have a way to date the graves or to even figure out which was older, which was younger. There was no stratigraphy. So he kind of uh, racked his mind for a little bit, trying to come up with a way to deal with this. And then he decided he would try and put the pottery in order based on style. Okay, so he collected a number of vessels from different tombs, and he decided he was going to look at these wavy-handed, uh, handled jars. Now, when he put them all together, right, um, and this is in the exercise I gave you, this page. There's also some other seriation problems, as you're going to see, right? But he had this collection. He knew that this vessel dated to the early dynastic to the end of the period, right? So he knows that this is the end, but then he wants to try and put the rest of these in order. Can you actually put them in order based on the style? Well, why don't you try that yourself and then unpause the video and we'll talk a little bit about what he found. Okay, hopefully you got something that looks a little bit like this. Um, this is exactly what he did. Um, he realized that, you know, that there, things have to kind of work in a series. There's kind of a slow progression. And if something is placed, you know, like reordered like this, you can see that this doesn't fit in. Here it fits into this progression. So it starts out with these large jars with prominent handles. The handles kind of move up on the body as the jar itself gets a little bit more narrow. The handles actually start to get a little smaller. Here you can see even less pronounced, even smaller. And here is another vessel, even skinnier, with the uh, handle is now just kind of, a, it's not even really a handle much anymore, but it's kind of a wavy line there. Uh, then the, the handle moves up, becomes very much less pronounced. It's just kind of an incision there. It's up on the neck, and then finally you end up with this cylindrical kind of beaker where now the handle is just a line incised on the neck of the vessel. Right? And so this is called stylistic seriation, putting things in a series based on changing style. So Flinders Petrie pioneered this. Um, now what I want you to do is to actually try a couple other problems. Um, I want you to try and put the Superman logos into order. I want you to try and put these vessels into order based on style. And I want you to put these rims of this pot in order, right? Now, there's, I'm not going to uh, grade you based on how close you get to the answer, right? Try to get as close as you can, uh, but you'll be learning from it. Um, and we'll go over it uh, next time so you can see how close you got. So this kind of seriation works with so many things. Um, you can use it on cars today, uh, you know, or, th or throughout time. Uh, you could use it on styles of um, clothing. Uh, for example, you know, this is from colonial North America. You can see the kinds of clay pipes and how they slowly changed and transformed over time. Um, and so this is a really useful technique. And again, it's a relative dating technique. Um, where you can say something is older, something is younger, uh, but not necessarily the exact uh, date. Right. Okay, so we learned about dating techniques, how they work, what they can be used on, if they're absolute or relative. Um, what we're going to be looking at next week is what happens after excavation. That is, how do you then start to analyze all the materials that you uh, got from the excavation, like artifacts, ecofacts, ecofacts, features, things like that. And that will be the topic for next week.